hello and welcome to the car carol channel live stream how you guys doing today i hope everybody's doing well and we come to you live from tccn automotive it's the first live stream one of many that we're going to start doing here and we're going to talk about the shop we're going to talk about a few things but let's get to the most important thing which is answering your questions so we can get as many questions as possible for the time that we have so starting Godfather, hi, blessings. Hope you're doing well. So the first question, David Bowman, any tricks for reinstalling the valve cover on an 05, 2005 Solara? I heard you need to use washers as the spacers between the bolts bottom up for tight. That is not the case. One thing about the valve covers in the Solara, and I'm assuming you're talking about a V6 Solara, not a four-cylinder. So the back valve cover is a little tricky when you get it to set in. Uh, make sure you don't roll the gasket. So as you're putting that valve cover in, you have the wire harness in your way, and you have the gear sticking up. It's very common that the gasket rolls as you're going back to put put the valve cover back in. So make sure it doesn't roll. The bolts are fine. Torque them to spec. They are not the type of bolts that, you know, you can all really over torque, but you could break them if you over torque them. You're not going to damage the thread or anything, but they're common when you over torque them, they just snap off. So torque them to spec, you won't have issues. They're going to leak after five, 10 years, but that's how it is with these engines. You can try replacing the bolts, it has been done before, but it's going to happen again. So just heads up, may just torque them to spec and you should be fine. Baba T, hello, fan from Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. I hope you're having a good day. Nelson Rodriguez, I have a 2003 Toyota Sienna. Can I use a different transmission fluid? I've been using Dextron 2. So Dextron 2 is okay. You can also use Toyota T, uh, T4. That's also compatible. But I wouldn't use a, you know another kind of fluid. Stick with the T4. T4 is actually very, very affordable. And it's comparable to much of the aftermarket uh, crowds, you know, the products. And I don't know why would you go aftermarket when the original is the exact same price. That's just my opinion on that. So Baba T, I have to drop by to check out your shop. Come on over. Just uh, it's, it's been really busy. We'll talk about that toward the end of the live stream. So Mohammed Daoud, I've been, I'm putting a three inch lift on my 2022 Forerunner. Will it mess up my Forerunner? So a two, three inch lift is okay. Just when you put the lift, make sure you look at your axle angles in the front. That is something that is common with the forerunners. When you put your axle in the front, you want your angles to not be extreme or your axles are hanging down because it's going to start ripping the axle. It's going to wear it. It's going to wear that needle bearing in the diff. So that's the only thing you want to look for. So... I've done three oil changes, has 10,000 miles. What's next? I have a 2021 RAV4. I think until you get to at least 50,000, 60,000, consider the coolant and the transmission fluid, and you should be good. So another question from Pete. My 2005 Camry Cruise Control won't accelerate or resume 50% of the time. Do you think the most likely cause is a faulty switch assembly. So if it's intermittent, the first thing I'm going to look at, and which you can test, but it's hard when it's intermittent, is the uh, what we call the spiral cable or clock spring in aftermarket lingo. It's it's the connection between the steering wheel and like the rest of the wiring. So when you turn the wheel, you still have an electrical connection. That's what the spiral cable is. Most likely that is it. And one thing I want you to check Sometimes when the spark cable has an intermittent break in the wire, like your cruise control won't work sometimes, but your volume controls depends on, on the trim you have. Some of them, some of these 05 cameras will have volume controls mode on the steering wheel. Those might stop working and your horn sometimes will stop working. And it could get to a point to extreme where your airbag light will come on intermittently. So these are the things I would look at, but that would be the first, because that's a wear item in that area more than the switch believe it or not these switches last a very long time so the spiral cable will be the first thing i would look at and another question from matthew brennan just bought a 2006 thunder two-wheel drive 100,000 miles just did a time about the water pump any other preferred maintenance do you suggest doing transmission fluid well if the fluid's never been done before i would 
I would be caution. I would caution you about it because actually this flow, it should have been done at least twice at this age, but if it's never been done, check the fluid. If it looks too dark, burn, I would leave it alone. If it's not, looks red, looks clean, then perhaps consider replacing it. Stephen Rapp, thank you so much, sir, for your generosity. I really appreciate it. Stephen Rapp is actually somebody I know personally, and he's a very nice guy and offered me a lot of advice, which I really appreciate. So another question, Marin, can't wait to meet you in person. I live in Northwest suburbs. Congrats on the shop. Thank you very much, sir. When to replace the PCB valve on a Lexus NX 200T. So there's no specific interval for the PCB valve, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to replace it when you do your spark plugs. You know, replace it at the same time and be done with it. That seems to be a good interval. On some models that have spark plugs that are 60,000 miles, yours is not one of them, but those that have 60,000 miles for everybody, wait till 120. 120,000 miles, 10 years, is a good interval for the PCB valve. Just replace it. On most models, it's easy and very DIY. On some of them, it's a little harder, but that will be a good interval that makes sense. Before that, I think you're overdoing it. Over that, there's a slight risk that you could have issues with it. Ryan Morris, 16.4 on a shifting from reverse to drive, occasionally causes TCS to kick on. Yesterday, I went to the drive and it just revved, then jerked forward, bad neutral safety switch. You called it right. So the bad. this is the first signs of the neutral safety switch going out. Eventually, you're gonna, it is gonna set a code. One thing I want you to notice, when that happened, did, did the indicator on the dash say drive or it just said nothing? This is sometimes you'll see it like flicker or it won't say anything until you move the shifter a little bit and all of a sudden it's in drive. If it happens again, when you put it in drive, nothing happens, Move it, to, move it to the following shift and see what happens. Put it immediately in reverse. See if you have gear shift because it's intermittent with this neutral safety switch. But that's very common on these fall runners, and that's something I would look into. So, Tina, is the 2023 Corolla ZR Toyota Corolla hybrid better than the 2022 for open road driving? So... I'm not sure about the ZR. I wonder if you mean GR Corolla. Uh, the GR Corolla, of course, is better driving-wise, but not like the hybrid. The hybrid is meant for efficiency. That's meant for performance. I don't know if this is what you are referring to. Ether Drive, why are trucks so much bigger than they were 20 years ago? 1999 Tacoma versus 22. It seems like I agree with you and everything seems to be growing in size. People want bigger cars, people want bigger trucks. And yeah, they are growing in size. The mentality is completely has changed over 20 years. People look at trucks as a cool, like utility truck that we'll use sometimes, but we want it to look at that cool truck look. Back in the day, it just used to be a truck. People hold stuff with it. And that's it. They were very basic. They didn't need to be this huge. So, Cam Dog, what's your favorite generation Tacoma? Has the third generation earned the same bulletproof reputation of the second generation yet? So, the Tacoma, I personally don't like the current model. It, it just, I've seen so many issues with the 16, 17 that it kind of took, took me back a little bit. I like the, the generation before that, the second generation. I really like those. They're really good, except with the rust issues, they were really bad. But otherwise, it was just like it felt like a truck, drove like a truck, looks like a truck. It is a truck. The newer one, I feel like they went too much on the technology and they didn't really update much. It is basically the same. They changed the engine, changed a few things, but they had some issues with them at the beginning. So, Dimitri. Thank you for your advice. Good luck on your new shop. Hello from Michigan. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. You guys are, are the best. So another question. Any trick to get a stuck sunroof in the tilt position down? I think my motor is bad on my 2008 Sequoia Limited. So the first thing you want to do when you have a sunroof issue that is stuck, reach in and try to pull the visor down. That's the first thing. Not the sun, not the visor on the headliner. The visor inside. Try to push it down and see sometimes if you take the motor and manually turn the like you'll see it here with the motor go if you can get something there you turn it it can manually come down take the glass off and try to move the tracks try to move the cables this is really this is really this is kind of the thing that is trial and error you keep trying things until you unjam the cable because if it's a bad motor you're going to be able to turn it by taking the motor off but if it's cables that are jammed 
you're going to have a hard time getting this off, honestly. Another question from ZA. Any advice for buying a JDM market Toyota for sourcing parts and service? I am interested in the Royal Rolls-Royce Toyota Century. Honestly, there's a lot of companies. Just be careful with important gray cars because you're going to have problems with parts and then the companies. Make sure whatever gray import car you buy, like I don't know if you're aware, 25 years or more in the U.S., you can actually buy a right-hand drive car that is 25 years or older without any big stuff. But make sure whatever car you buy has a U.S. title because they're really hard to title and the VIN is different. And you're going to have some interesting conversation with your local DMV about the VIN. That's just how it is with these cars. Kevin FM, how long do you think the 2G RFK S 3.5 will last before it's discontinued for turbos? That might be coming up soon. Honestly, guys, I'm going to say this not based on information that I'm telling you and all this. It's just a hunch. When they got rid of it from the app, from the Highlander, that's not a good sign. We might see it go away because of emission regulations. And for it to leave the Highlander means it is not emission compliant, and we might see it leave much sooner than we anticipate. I thought it was going to last a little longer, but I guess not. So loaded fan. Besides all the break-in suggestions for new cars, any other recommendations for mods that would be crucial to do new? like ceramic coating, tint, interior stuff for a forerunner. The first thing is, if you live in any, any kind of salty winter weather, get the frame coated. This is more important than anything else. One thing on the forerunners, and actually on any Toyota, if you want it to, to stay looking like new, first get a ceramic coating. It's not a bad idea. Don't overspend a ceramic coating because I... See, some people really spend a lot of money on ceramic coating. Ceramic coating wears off after a certain amount of time. So I'd rather you buy a mid-grade, something reasonable, and then reapply it every few years, every year, whatever the manufacturer recommends. But something that is important with Toyota is the paint on the hood. If you do a lot of driving, you have construction in your area, perhaps consider on the forearms, they have these bug deflectors that really work well, or get a clear film. I know some people have... Um, Opinions on the clear foam that it changes color. If you get a high quality one, it will not change color. It will look nice. You won't see it. And if you're worried about changing color, just do the whole hood, whole, you know, um, fenders, and you should be good. But this is the stuff that I would do to a new car if you're going to be driving a lot of highways. But otherwise, I mean, they're really a complete package. You don't need really to do much to them. So love my M20A FKS. I like that, that username. I recently inherited my grandfather's 2005 Camry LE V6. It has 117,000 miles and impeccable service since brand new, except for the transmission service. Should I change the fluid with these high miles? Honestly, I would caution you against that because that's a little bit too much miles. If it's never been done, which is odd, that transmission needs to be done every 30,000 miles. So that's a little bit too overdue. This is, we're talking old school, we use T4. So that's a little bit too many miles to risk it, but do check the fluid condition first and kind of adjust from there. If you end up changing the fluid, change the filters where in this one, because this one is a little overdue there. So SP 2013 FJ Cruiser, 136,000 miles, getting new struts and shocks, stock height, how important it is to get new upper strut mounts, OEM, or doesn't matter. It is crucial that you replace the mounts. Honestly, most more than likely, you're going to end up destroying the mounts when you take the struts apart. Something that is notorious for these. So you go to take the nut that holds the strut at the top, you just start spinning the shock. And, and by the way, it destroys the mount. And by the time you hold it and get it off and heat it up and do the, the mount is destroyed. And when you get the bolt off, finally, the mount gets seized to the, the shaft of the strut. You're going to be fighting this thing so much, it's going to end up getting destroyed. Replace it. Now, as far as OEM or doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter on this one only on the trucks because it doesn't have a bearing. It is not as delicate as some of your unibody cars, Camry, Corolla, Highlander, etc. So it doesn't matter, but do compare OEM because I see people pay over OEM price for aftermarket. It absolutely makes no sense. If you're going to, if, if the original one's $150, for example, and let's say that the aftermarket one is 50, well, 
that makes sense. But when the original one is 150 and you're paying 135, 140 for an aftermarket, it makes no sense at that point. You're not really saving anything. You're just taking a risk here. And usually I, I, I'm going to give you an advice here that I, I see a lot of my viewers that I've met that have worked on their cars and whatnot, tell them this is just, they're like, oh, wow, that makes sense. Think of the amount you are, parts you are replacing right now on your car. Well, if you want to know how long the original is going to last, you have a 2013 FJ Cruiser. This is a nine-year-old truck. Your originals lasted nine years. Well, if you buy the originals again, expect them to last nine years. But if you buy an aftermarket, it could last half that or less. Or could last the same. But you again, now you're taking into a guess into the unknown. So... This is how your mentality needs to be. Okay, if this part's gonna last 10 years and I paid half for a part that's gonna last half the time, five years, well, it's the same thing in the end except the labor. But if you're gonna pay almost the same, it doesn't make sense because the original aftermarket parts, they just don't last unless you get a really good one and then you're paying the same as the original, it doesn't make sense. Keps LGR, so, 21 RAV4 Prime, when the gas engine first turns on coal, there's a rattle for about one to two seconds. Could it be VVTI, hyper system balancer? So it's more, this is something for all hybrids and all, even the, the primes. So hybrids, when the engine doesn't run for a long time, it'll have like, a, we call it a cold start misfire because this engine is shut off, it's cold. And then all of a sudden you jolted with a thousand RPM, RP, like starting RPM. It's going to have a, like a little jerk and a misfire. It's not really a misfire, but it's a mechanical misfire. Things all of a sudden start moving and it's going to shake the planetary in the transmission. And that's the noise you hear. It's actually not from the engine. My Camry does that, 2022 Camry. You know, there was times I was driving a car for a review or whatever. It stayed parked for a week. And I go start it. It does that. And I know exactly what that is. And if you ever hear a hybrid misfire, you're going to hear that same sound, right? It sounds like the engine wants to blow up. That is normal, not to be mistaken with a VVTI sound. That's just because we don't have a starter that's spinning the engine at 200 RPM. We're spinning this engine immediately at idle speed, sometimes 1,000, 1,100 RPM. So that's normal. Don't mistake that for a problem with VVTIs. Plain fan. I purchased a 2022 Corolla a couple weeks ago, built in Mississippi, discovered the front door is misaligned. Have you seen this before on new Toyotas? They are rare that you will see like a very obvious misalignment, but the things do happen. Um, take it back to the dealership, bring it to their attention. They usually will take care of it. It's not an issue. Um, if usually when you have a door that's misaligned, you'll have whistling sounds, little, little like you'll feel something is off with the door. It's not a big deal. They can adjust it, they can get it perfect, and life is good. Does it happen a lot? It does not, but does it? happen period it does happen nobody's perfect even you know as, as as high standard as toyota holds they're not perfect nobody is and that's just the little things that you see sometimes congratulations on your shop i really appreciate it sir thank you so much so sebi just got a 2013 prius v how do i check if the battery is good i checked the fan and it was clogged with dust and a piece of plastic i am worried there might be some damage to the battery honestly there is no real easy way to check hybrid batteries because short of testing every individual cell you're really not going to know and by looking at the voltages you're not subjecting these to load you need to like load test each cell and that's there is machines that does that, but they're multi thousand dollar machines that do that. They're not even a dealership. They're like aftermarket stuff that works, but you're not going to really be subjected to that. And if there's something that works well, I would consider buying it for the shop because that is the number one question that we get. How long is this battery going to last, and what kind of condition it's in? It's really hard to tell. But the clogged fan is a problem. Something. Don't be alarmed for now. Just know that battery prices are dropping for some reason, and there's a lot of options now. So don't be alarmed. Clean the fan. Keep an eye on it. Make sure you take care of this car. Don't let it sit for a very long time. Try to give it good charge and discharge cycles, you know, by driving it frequently and not just letting it sit for weeks and weeks, especially now that you're cleaning the fan. Hopefully it is good, but really there's no concrete way to tell an exact 
um, health of that battery without specialized equipment, which is not really readily available, even at a dealership level, believe it or not. So David Kelly on a 2GR FE, 2008 Sienna, changed plugs, used wrong bolts on Plenum too long. Now it starts, but stalls in 30 seconds. No D2 codes. I'm going to ask you a question, and this is going to sound interesting. Did you install, there is a connector on the, so I'm assuming you removed the cowl here. On the Sierras, on the, God help my memory, on the left side, not sorry, the right side. See, I am now confused by the camera because I was looking at the camera. So on the passenger side of the van, right at the bottom of the cowl, you guys see a, like a little device, let's call it, yay big, probably few inches long, has a connector to it. If you forgot to connect that, that is your problem. Go connect it, the car will start right up. Because I don't see using the wrong bolts for the plenum causing this issue. This is very common, and that little device is actually the driver inject, uh, the injector driver, very common. Many technicians have fell for this one. You leave that unplugged after you install the cowl, happens all the time. You start the van, runs perfectly, boop, shuts off. And some people, some techs, when this when this van was newer, when they were we were first doing the spark plugs on them, they were chasing a ghost, not knowing what happened to this. What is it? No codes, no nothing. It just shuts off after a few seconds. Sometimes it even lasts up to thirty seconds. When they're when they're hotter, they're actually shut off sooner for some reason. I don't know why they do that, but that's how it is. So go check that connector. And as far as the bolts, take them out. Make sure the Intake manifold, it has no cracks or nothing. Correct the bolts. Not likely, unless you really push them down and over tighten them, then you would have felt something break. But if that's the case, it's an aluminum intake manifold. You can replace it if something is cracked, but it wouldn't cause the truck to shut off after 30 seconds. You will hear like a hissing sound or something, but not cause it to shut off. That is very specific, and I've seen this before. All right, let's see. So John Smith, my dealership says they don't do anything special for hybrids and their AC, but I thought they are supposed to use a special oil that they said they do the same for every car. Well, th this is really alarming when a dealership says that. It's, it's not a special machine. Let's just clarify that because I have that machine right here in the shop. It is not a special machine. There are You either use a separate machine that hasn't been contaminated with the oil designed for non-hybrids or the machine that I have, the machine has a capability of flushing the line. So every time you're, you're let's say you were servicing non-hybrids and now you're going to service a hybrid, you have to flush the lines, clear everything from the lines, including the oil, before you use it on a hybrid. Now, this machine that I have that usually does that flushing cannot inject oil. That's the key thing here. So you have to get a separate tool to inject oil if you need to so that's the key thing here but when the dealership says oh yeah we use the same machine on every single car that is so bad it sounds so bad and if they really do that it is not good because they're going to fry your compressor in a short period of time that's not good that's really not good so r more 07 have have you seen any new issues pop up in toyota's built during the supply shortage era, example, how are 2021, 2022 forerunners compared to the past years? So I have not seen really issues other, you know, the norm, you know, you've got new models come out, they have issues and run them issues here and there. But one thing on the forerunners I've noticed, and this is 2022, fit and finish from the, from the Tahara factory is usually exceptional. I mean, something unbelievable. Exceptional is the word. I've seen them a little bit drop for the standards of the Hara factory. They're not, they're not nearly as much as the other factories, especially the U.S. ones, but they've dropped from Tahara. I don't know if it's a batch, but bumpers that are fitting right. Certain things are not like that. 110% of Toyota. They're maybe just 100 or 90%. That's the only thing I've noticed about the newer models. But otherwise, they're really just business as usual. I haven't really seen anything. Chicago Cubs. I've been able to share what you've taught me with my boys and their friends. Your videos on shopping for OEM parts were spot on. I was able to buy OEM folders from Oakwood Theater for 350. 
Thank you very much, sir. I'm glad I could help. That's that's why I started the channel. It really brings joy to my heart when you guys actually benefit from the information that I put out. So, Chai, planning to trade my 2013 Avalon to Highlander. I want to own it for the rest of my life. Is the new inline four turbo engine as reliable as the V6 and maintenance cost? Honestly, this engine has been out for such a short time. There is good it has good bones coming from the a25 just been a while been there for a while kind of has a good like uh, foundation if you would but as far as the turbo it's really going to depend on your maintenance how you take care of it what kind of problems they have if you're buying a first run of this engine i wouldn't i would wait if, especially if you're going to have this car for the rest of your life i would wait or just buy a v6 that's the V6 has been proven enough. They had issues in the beginning when it came on 17 in the Highlander, but now they're all taken care of and you don't have issues. If you want to really not wait and you need to do this now, um, stick with the V6. If you if you can wait two, three years, wait for them to work out the initial little issues with the tur new turbo engine, then buy one. <clears throat> Loco Por Toyota is the 2023. Corolla hybrid all-wheel drive, a brand new design, and should wait a couple of years or it's a matured design. I was waiting for someone to say that because, sorry, Toyota, but I, I love the PR folks that I've talked to. You know, they give me the press cards to do the reviews for you guys. But I saw an absolute uh, mess up from the release of the, the current you know, they, every once in a while they'll have a new product release and all the journalists go all happy, but nobody noticed a few things. First, they mentioned specifically fifth generation hybrid system. Okay, maybe the journalists didn't notice, but I look at the pictures. So they had that Corolla Cross that was the, okay, for lack of a better word, it's, it's not a pleasant color. It's not my favorite color. Let's put it this way, greenish, yellowish, whatever you want to call it. It said very clearly in the pictures for the media release, XSE hybrid. Cool. I look at the engine pictures, I see an alternator, and I see a battery. This is not a hybrid. So the picture they have, it either belongs to another car or the car they had was not actually a hybrid. They just put a hybrid badge on it for the photo shoot. What happened there? And then when I saw some other journalists that went to the like the actual event, they opened the hood on that car, and it looks to me like a Lexus UX 250H, uh, basically a fourth generation hybrid system with a M20A FK, FXS in that case. What is so new about that? And it's basically the exact same configuration as a Corolla, just the engine is not a 1.8, it's a 2.0 dynamic force. Are we calling that the fifth generation hybrid? Because the hybrid system is exactly the same. Inverter, two connectors at the top. Maybe they've changed a few things in the internals, but doesn't look like a new generation. That came out in 2016, that generation of hybrid. So no, there is nothing different about the new Corolla. Sorry, I harped about this, but when I saw that, I'm like, whoa, that is not good because most people won't notice this stuff. But as soon as I saw that picture, I'm like, that is not a hybrid. And, I, and if it is, we have big problems. That means they completely changed the hybrid system. And now it's like a Tundra hybrid system. That's not actually good because the hybrid system is awesome. But uh, there is not going to be really major change. It's basically, they're actually the Corolla hybrid. I don't have the exact, the all-wheel drive. I don't have the exact, exact technical details because they haven't come out yet. But my estimation is it's going to be very similar to a to a Prius all-wheel drive. So it's something tried and true. I wouldn't worry about it. Damon Collins, I am I am I am a two Highlander family, twelve and eighteen, and longtime DIYer, and I want to program new smart keys and reset battery computer. Do you still recommend the X Tool T8? Congratulations on the shot. Thank you so much, sir. So. If you have a 12 and 18, yes. One thing that came up, some of the newer cars, when I say newer, like the newest generation, 19 and up, uh, RAV4 for the Highlanders, 2020 and up, they changed the immobilizer to the new generation. So be careful with those with aftermarket scan tools. Support might not be there yet, but for yours, you should be able to do everything 
with actually a cheaper tool. If you're just buying it for that, they, I think that company or many other companies, they offer just a tool that just programs keys and does FOPs. It's going to be cheaper than a D8, but if you're a DIYer, you might benefit from the D8. But I think the D8 will be a little bit better than the D7. I know there's a price difference, but it is just an overall better package, in my opinion. D7 is more for a beginner um, DIYer that wants a good scan tool, but the other one is more capable. Ray L. 2004 Forerunner V6, 134,000 miles, no check engine light, strong exhaust smell when starting. Any any suggestions? Uh, exhaust manifolds or small leaks that as the exhaust expands, they close up. Best way to check exhaust, especially in a Forerunner that you can lean underneath it, have a towel just kind of fold it up and have someone plug the exhaust and lean underneath it. You're going to hear it hissing. When you have leaks sometimes pinhole leaks are really hard to find with noise of the engine running but if you plug the exhaust you'll have that thing whistling so loud you'll immediately be able to tell where that noise is coming from that's the best way to diagnose exhaust leaks actually so slade getting rid of my 2011 ford fusion garage on wheels hoping and hopping into my first toyota uh oh what happened to that question Let's see. Well, I don't know what, the, what happened to the question. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. And hopping into my first Toyota in about a month, 2022 RAV4. Glad I found your stuff. Oh, you're not gonna. You're uh, you're gonna be happy because uh, yeah, coming from a Ford Fusion, I actually recently drove a Ford Fusion. I don't know if it was 2011, but I think it was 18, 19. I, I just I was not very impressed. They're they're I'm they're getting rid of them. They're not making them anymore. I guess, but. Uh, yeah, it's they're not pretty with that little rotary thing. Anyways, another question. I wonder if the permanent use of brake hold system leads to premature wear if I use it on my daily basis city driving. Well, I hope not because I use it on my say, daily basis city driving. Look, it does not. But here's one thing you need to know. If you're driving in super heavy rain and you've been driving, you know, apply, like let's say you're in a mountainous area, you've been applying your brakes very hard, you really overheated them, it's raining and they're getting water splashed on them. If you stand on that brake hole for an extended period of time, you could actually mark the rotors because they're too hot, pads stay in the same place, apply for a long time. But I mean, technically, that's going to happen when you stop the car. It's not really doing anything different. This is the only way where excessive use of that, when you don't need it, will cause some issues. But that's a very specific scenario that you might actually have issues with the brakes regardless, even if you're using it or not. So go ahead, use it, love it. It's one of my favorite features on the Camry, which we're going to be doing a six-month update. Maybe it's been six months. So actually, we're nearing our six months here. Uh, we I've got to film the video, change the oil, and we'll talk about it. But uh, that's one of my favorite features. I just wish it came out automatically. You had an option. Lala G, how you doing, sir? It's really good to see you. So loaded fan. Also, do you know any way to avoid having options installed at port before making it to the dealership? Well, that's, uh, I tried. And my Camry, initially, when, when it was allocated, they had all these accessories, body side molding, all this, to me, fluff that, that overpriced fluff. I told him I want nothing, not even floor mats, because I was going to buy my own floor mat. It came with port installed uh, wheel locks. So, unfortunately, there's no control. I couldn't get them not to install them. They just did because some old paperwork, whatever. Unfortunately, unless you really push on the dealership, they're just not going to do it. So really push on your dealership and tell your salesman, I will not take this car, although that's not a problem lately, but tell them I will not take delivery of this car and I will really be upset if you have any accessories that I did not want. That's the only way because they can remove them if the car hasn't been built yet. That's the one thing you need to ask a very specific question. Another question, Michael, my 2010 Toyota Rumion, which is a Cyan XP, okay, is equipped with a K311 CVT. It uses CVT TC oil, but the 2013 model with the exact same transmission uses CVT FE. Can I use CVT FE? So 
this is a question that's come up and I could not find any information on it. Even I asked some guys at Toyota Land, they, they really did. Now we don't have, a, in the US, we do not have CVTTC. I don't know the specifications on it. I tried to look at not the stuff you can find online, but I wanted to real specification. Are they compatible? They just don't give you the information. They don't, like Toyota doesn't give us in the US, doesn't give us CVT FE compatibility with other fluids. So that's the problem. I wouldn't risk it. I would get the exact fluid that this transmission needs in case, especially with CVTs are really not the transmission you want to be experimenting with fluid. So get the real correct fluid for it. So Lion Runner, I noticed the Forerunner head unit firm up where update has a fix on blower motor speed. Is this for dual climate control ones or the manual climate control ones? So this is going to be on the automatic climate control because the manual one actually doesn't have any software. It's just, you know, just a button to turn on the blower. This is, this is on the limited, limited models that has the automatic um, climate control. And I can double check that, but I am 95% sure that I'm going to try and run because also uh, I had a forerunner with a, with an electrical problem, some aftermarket stuff and the manual one does not have any sort of computer control that I'm going off memory here, but it is to the limited ones on that one. Gary White, I'd love to know your thoughts on the Toyota batteries as well as who manufactures them. And also if you think that there's a special lifetime replacement of their batteries still worth it. Well, Toyota original battery, the black ones are made by Interstate. And then there's the Panasonic ones, the Panasonic ones, they're, you know, they're usually on Japanese made cars, different supplier. People say they're better. Yeah, they're the same thing, maybe. Interstate is a really good company. But the replacement battery you buy from the, your dealership is made by Interstate. Two Toyota specifications, two Toyotas, not sizing, sizing is standard, but the CCA. And internal word has it that uh, they all have the same CCA, but actually Toyota tells them, okay, I well, want 585. Well, here's a 700 watt. 700 one let's just put 585 it's never less it's usually more so that's good but uh on the lifetime replacement that is another dealership very beautiful gimmick nothing is a lifetime folks two things i want you to know when you go into any shop any automotive dealership any automotive repair first thing is there is nothing lifetime we are as humans we are not lifetime Nothing is lifetime. There's always some kind of disclaimer or something. That's the first thing. The second thing is there is nothing free in life but the love of God. So when the dealership tells you this is lifetime warranty, this is free, there is always a catch. Guaranteed. Now, it's not always meant to be like a, a kind of something bad or they're trying to fool you or but they're trying to kind of change the wording on something that is standard. You know, some of these lifetime warranties that have so many exclusions, it makes it look like you're like worse than the cheapest warranty or the lifetime replacement of the battery. Oh, we will replace it. We warranty your battery for the life of the car as long as you come every two months to test it. Something like that. I'm just giving you an example here, but be wary of lifetime stuff with, auto, with anything, especially automotive repair because it's uh there's always a catch our night 2009 toyota highlander the courtesy light comes on intermittently while driving i've been removing the door switches what do i do next so if you've done all four door switches disconnected them and it still flickers look at your back door and look at your hatch glass that's really the only other thing in the back door the switch is integrated in the latch itself there is no really other switch. There's not like the door. It's a little bit more difficult to get into it. Disconnect it. Then see. Just don't do this mistake. So I remember one of our apprentices did this mistake. Do not disconnect the latch and close the door. Remember that this is an electronic latch on this Highlander. So make sure you leave the door panel off when you do this you might want to close it because you're going to go drive it and see if it intermittent but don't put the door panel on because then you have 
no way of getting it unless you you almost risk damaging that door panel so take the door panel off disconnect it then close then go test when you want to go back into getting it make sure the back is clear not filled with stuff to the top so you can crawl through the car in the back and then there's a little handle inside once the door panel is off so you can pull it and then push the door and it'll open it's a manual release don't forget this part this part is important folks don't with these uh, electronically op operated doors, uh, you want to make sure that you leave some kind of entrance to the door from the back. Sean O'Connell, how you doing, sir? Thank you so much for joining us. Trucker Rick, thank you so much for joining us as well, sir. Thomas Garcia. Looking forward to seeing you in July for work on my 2010 RX 350. Yes, I, I actually remember your name. Question, do I, I do have, hold on, let me read that again. Question I do have is, the question you have is, what do you recommend to condition and take care of the leather in my car? So there's many, many products out there. Honestly, to say this one is better than this one, this one they're all good. Bottom line, it's, it's it's how often you do it and how well you do it is really what matters. Just news flash. Some people will disagree with that, but to each their own. Mothers make good product. Uh, I think Groyd's Garage makes something for a Groyd's Garage is someone I, I a product line that I've used a lot and I really like their stuff. A little bit on the expensive side, but they do good stuff and I like their attention to details. Their stuff. Uh, it, it, the the important thing is how often you do it. Um, every year I do that in my S class, the Camry doesn't really have real leather. So we're not going to do that, but the S class has real leather, uh, before that the Avalon had real leather. So, um, every six to eight months, I actually used to clean them and put conditioner on them. And really it's a very simple process. Mostly the driver's seat, you know, my Avalon had 10 interior. So is my S class. I'm a mechanic. I'm going to get in the car. We're going to have a few stains here or there that's going to stay in the seat. That's why I regularly clean it. But I wouldn't put it as a specific time interval to clean them. Just use a good cleaner. You usually come in a kit. One bottle is a cleaner. One bottle is a conditioner. And that should work. Just don't overpay for the stuff either. And I, and I have to say that some people assume that more, more expensive is better. Yeah, it might be better, but do you need it is the question. That's... David, regarding the oil filter on the 2GRFE, there's an aftermarket conversion that converts the cartridge style to spin-on style. Some say it's better because it prevents backflow. Well, this was actually supposed to be, and this is my fault, uh, this was supposed to be a video topic, and I'm still going to get to it, but let's talk about it briefly, and then in the video, I'll actually show you what happens. On the canister style filters for Toyotas, if for those that have serviced them or seen them, when you pull the filter, the housing has the paper filter inside of it. When you pull the paper filter, there's like a pipe inside. If that pipe comes off and you think we are just going to put that pipe inside the filter, put it all back, put it in the car, you will have serious problems or worse if there is no pipe. Folks, this is important. I don't like modifications to the original design because this company will claim lifetime warranty and free 17 million oil changes remember those two words that we talked about but where is this company going to be when you've put this filter you drove this car for a year and all of a sudden you have bearing material because something was not thought of not this was you're modifying the original design and one of my least favorite modifications is to the oil system there's always something missed folks do not modify the original design Unless you're, you just know that you're taking a risk, it's not worth it. When you have a problem with the original cartridge from Toyota, replace it with an original one, not an aftermarket one, an original one, you will not have a problem as long as you torque them to spec. If you not don't have that muscle memory of not over tightening them, especially the plastic ones, the plastic ones will last the life of the car. If you always never over tighten them and treat them with love don't just take the filter and let it drop i see this I, I at the dealership i see this all the time and i don't understand it like why do you do this 
take the filter and just spin it and let it drop and make a giant mess. I was like, what are you doing here? You, you could have just cracked that filter. And this is how these filters become a problem. If you treat them with love and respect, they will treat you with love and respect by lasting a lifetime. So keep that in mind. I personally don't like it. It's up to you if you want to experiment with it. Jeff G have a 21 forerunner and I love it. Also love the new Tundra. At least due in two years, Tundra would be in the third model year. Should I keep the forerunner or try the Tundra? I personally like the Tundra more than the, the uh, sorry, I like the forerunner more than the Tundra because I feel like the Tundra is too big for my taste. But again, we're talking about personal taste. They're both good, good trucks. Personally, I think the for the the Forerunner will have better function. It's an SUV, drives nicer. The Tundra, even though it's improved, it still rides like a truck. It's rough and bum bouncy and all that. I think the build quality on the Forerunner is much higher. The fit and finish on the Forerunner is even with the 22 being a little bit lesser, it still is a lot higher than the. There's something that is a disappointment. We talked about this when I reviewed the Tundra. The fit to finish is just appalling for lack of a better word. They could really do a better job here and they just didn't. I hope they changed. But that's, you know, that's the difference. You going from a forerunner, especially into a tundra, you're gonna feel like, okay, this is not as nice as the forerunner. So I wouldn't rush that. You have some time, so just I would stay with that forerunner because you're gonna love the forerunner. If it stays the same by then, which is you know, it might come with a new model. It might be the same thing. Who knows? We'll find out. Leo, CT200H, downhill in B and battery fully charged. Start hearing a different sound from the engine front wheels and the hybrid battery fan run constant, normal. Yes. So this is the question that I ask a lot, actually. So let's address it real quick. You're going downhill and you're you're pressing on the brake or you're in b mode and and now you're charging the battery although b mode does not charge the battery but you're just because you're going downhill you're you're not accelerating at all you're eventually going to create enough as you're coasting in b mode you're eventually going to generate enough to top off the battery and now it's fully charged what's going to happen then nothing folks b mode will basically almost shut off and it won't take charge anymore. It's just gonna disengage the motors, let them free spin, not gonna overcharge that battery. This is not, this is a well-engineered system, folks. It's not gonna overheat and overcharge the battery. And the reason that fan is running because you're charging that battery for a long, consistent period of time. If you take off B mode, this will happen a lot more rapid. And I see it in my camera. I, I recently drove it in a hilly area. You're going downhill, I just let it coast. And that battery got full and you immediately feel it like almost started coasting faster because now it's no longer regenerating. So don't worry about that. And the battery, the fan running constant, it did do that as well because it's charging for a long period of time. Remember, just to think of your 12 volt battery. When you charge it, it gets hot. That's normal. But if you charge it for two minutes, it's not going to really get hot. If two minutes here, two minutes there, two it's not going to get hot. But if when you charge it for a continuous period of time, it's going to get hot and that fan is going to run that's normal. So nothing to worry about there. And it's not going to overcharge that battery. So don't worry. Steven Rapp, thank you so much, sir, for some good donuts for your ground opening, which is tomorrow, by the way. Or as you see, thank you so much, Steven. I really appreciate it, brother. All right. Let's see where we're at. Thank you so much, Christina. There we go. So Alex Juan, should I consider a 2013 GX 460 with 150,000 miles? 150,000 miles on a 2013 GX is barely broken in, honestly. If this has no rust and has good service history. If this has good service history, it looks like the owner really took pride and took care of it. This is nothing, the miles is nothing. Make sure it doesn't have rust, make sure it has a full service history. If that's if they're rust free or relatively low rust, good maintenance, that's a good truck. That's a very good truck. Caesar, I just purchased a 2021 Highlander LE with 14,000 miles, but it did not come with a user manual or books. What's the best way to obtain them in the US? So you should go if, if you, oh, you bought it used. I'm looking at 14,000 miles. The dealership can order them for you. I think there is a website. 
and and I have it saved somewhere. There is a website that the dealership can give you, and you can order it, or they can order them for you. They're not gonna they're 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 not really expensive at all. So that's they can order them through the dealership. It actually goes back many years back. You can order them. It's not just new stuff because uh, it's a separate company that makes these books for for Toyota. So you got to order it through them. So Daddy Gonzalez. Is it true that the 2023 RAV4 will have an update? I don't think so. If anything, you might not see an update in the RAV4 until 24, 25, at least. 20, 25, perhaps, more likely. Because 2022 did get an update. I mean, you know, change the mascara and some highlighter or whatever you call it. Change the makeup a little bit. Um, not really a full-on change. It's a media refresh. But that just happened in 2022. If this is going to go on, a, on the typical six-year run, three on the first, three on the refresh, we're just coming into the second year of the refresh, 23. So we still have at least one more year, 24, maybe 25. You'll see a full-on update. So Mervin, I have a 2000 Toyota Tundra and it cranks, but the engine doesn't turn over. Sounds like something is grinding. That doesn't sound good. Uh, if you, it sounds like it's cranking very fast or something odd, you might have a broken timer belt. That's, there is every, I want every DIY mechanic, and I, one of these days, we're going to get a car with no compression here, and I will record that sound so you hear it. The, all engines, when they have no compression, broken timer belt, bent valves, broken chain, stuff, disastrous stuff like that. They will crank at such a high RPM, and then they'll, they won't have that, like, compression up, down, up, down in the sound. It'll be just constant. If you take all the spark plugs out of your engine and crank it, it'll sound the same. Because now there's no compression. There's no resistance to slow down that cranking. It's just be constant, like you're spinning a motor. If you hear that, that is not a good sign. So... That's you want to investigate, but one thing before you do that is it the starter that is spinning or is the actual engine? Look at the crank, make sure the crank is at least spinning before you go any further. Guy, man, are head bolt issues all that common on the 2004 2AZ FE 2004 RAV4? Honestly, that generation RAV4 did have issues with the head bolts. I remember I've had plenty of them that that you know. Pulled, pulled the threads, and now we have a giant head gasket leak. But uh, not as much on the later years. Like 04, 05, it was a lot less than the earlier ones. And the very early ones, for some reason, were also not. It's, it seems like 2001, uh, 2000, not 2001, 2002 and three were the biggest years for this. 2004 got a lot less, 2005 even more. That seems to be the, the target year, even the Camry, 2002 and three were the most affected, the later ones, they could still be affected, but not as at a higher rate. You overheat these things once pretty bad, it's gone, it's done. So that's the problem with 2AZ, is do not overheat it and it won't um, overheat itself on you. And that water pump goes out typical or radiator and it overheat and that's the end of that. Hey, hey, what's your view on the 2014 IS300H? Any known or common issues? We do not have an IS300H because we are not as cool as some of you around the world. I think an IS hybrid is a very cool idea and it really would work. We don't have them, so there's not a lot of information I have to offer for them. So, Vic Vickerson, should I drain and refill the transmission oil on my 2016 Toyota Sienna for the first time or just leave it alone, 125,000 miles? This one is tricky. It's a little bit too much miles for me to be comfortable with it. It will be a risk, not as high of a risk as if you have more miles, but it will be a risk. So, do it at your own risk, honestly. And at this point, you know, take a small sample, see how it looks. Is it gritty? Is it burned? Does it have a burn smell? Or does it dark but it has a red tint to it then perhaps the risk would be less but it is a risk nonetheless so sapo another question is it bad to leave my car ignition on without the engine running like turning on accessories to change charge my phone without the engine running it's not bad but you're going to kill your battery eventually so be mindful of that i'd rather you 
keep the car running so you're not charging your phone but damaging your your battery you know you're just deeply discharging this battery over and over and over it's actually going to reduce its health that's not good for it I'm talking about the 12 volt battery here another question chicago cups on my <clears throat> 2010 camry i bent the corner of the oil pan when removing it should i try to straighten it before reinstalling or should i just buy a new one do you have any tips on reinstalling the pan using flip it so i personally would just replace it it's not worth it you can straighten it but here's what you need to be aware of straighten it and if you see chipping of the paint you're going to want to paint it because it's going to start rusting even if you don't live in the salt just water hitting it it's steel pan that's something on Toyotas. They still use steel pans. They don't use aluminum pans. Um, much better, by the way, because whatever bent that steel pan would have broken the aluminum. So if you straighten it, there's no scraping of the paint. We're good. If scraping happens on the outside where paint starts chipping off on the outside, you're okay. Put some high temperature. Not on the inside, though. Do not put paint on the inside because you don't know if that paint is going to react with the oil and now you have all kinds of chemicals flowing in the engine do not do that it's not worth it these pans if you shop around you'll find them for a cheaper price as far as installing you'll take a razor blade and you'll take a um, red scotch bright pad you're going to use that razor blade first be very careful with a razor blade if you're not familiar using razor blades scrape off all the big chunks of of old stuff on the engine on the sub pan on the aluminum part do not use excessive force. Do not make lines in it. You're going to use it just to scrape off the old stuff. And tomorrow we're going to do a job here that you'll see how I do that. Then you're going to take that scotch right pad and lightly scuff what is left until you have a very clean and smooth surface. Then you're going to go over to the oil pan. The oil pan is a lot more forgiving because it's steel, not aluminum. Aluminum, we start grinding at it too much, creates divots, creates that fine dust that goes everywhere. And to clean everything, cleanliness is very important here. you got to use a really good degreaser or brake clean also works really well because it evaporates, doesn't leave residue. That's another thing. Good brake clean. Um, you can use very liberal amounts, clean everything, dry it up. Uh, put the sealer around the oil pan. Whenever you see, like, let's say this is a bolt hole, you're going to go on the inside, not on the outside, and don't make a circle. You can make a circle, but it's going to look ugly. It's just OCD. Apply it like the factory would. Go in a straight line. Be liberal with the sealer. Don't go too much, but don't go like a very thin line. Be liberal. It's not going to cause any issues here on the, on the oil pan. Some places it will, but not in the oil pan. Go around it and put it back don't wait too long put it back put the bolts if you're not very familiar with torquing just torquing down just back and you're good to go you're not going to start that engine or put oil for at least one hour preferably more now one hour you're okay if you're gonna put oil start it and let it warm up then you're okay but if you're gonna just put oil let it sit don't do that just leave it let it dry be very clean and when you have oil will keep running down and make it a mess you have to keep wiping it you have hope well, i'm used to it on a lift but pan in hand towel on the other you're gonna wipe it down one more time and then immediately set the pan that way you're you're reducing the risk of oil running down from the top that is very important be very clean with this job that pan that oil inside of that oil pan has to be spotless where you would you could eat off of it don't eat off of it but we want it to look like that kind of like the shop floor here i always tell mrs car Carnot, i want it to look like somebody can eat off of it we're not going to recommend it or do it but just the appearance we want it to be that so mrs car Carnot says she already did i really hope you didn't that was a joke for those who uh, heard it sq <laughs> My 2013 GS350 radiator motor fans are making noise when turned on. Can I replace the motor fans from other 2GR engines like the Sienna or RC350, IS350? 350? Potentially from the RC and the IS, it would be trial and error for something like a Sienna or a front, you know, front-wheel drive configured car. It will be a trial and error, but there's a chance. If you look around and compare part numbers on the motor itself, you might find one that is the same but is it going to be have the same brackets 
I would first look at the RC and the IS because those are more likely that they're going to be very similar. And don't you love these cute little bottles with the car care and I bought them for the shop? I like them. It's, I usually drink half the bottle and just leave it laying down. And it gets cold, it gets hot and now I'll put it back in the skin. But these, uh, these are nice. I like them. All right. Let's see where we were at here. Oh, and I do it by mouse. Here it is. E-Rias, are the shocks and struts easy to change on a 2007 Yaris four-door? I'm trying to remember which model had the weird shocks. I think it was this Yaris. So this Yaris had a strange mount in the front. The shocks are really easy in the back, but the front mounts were kind of strange. But, I mean, they're, they're not hard. They're very, very simple. But just if you're used to doing other Toyotas, this front mount will be a little bit different, but it's not really very Hard to do, they're very simple, especially the rears. The rears are a joke, but the fronts are kind of odd to look at. Uh, let's take another question. Jason Montejano, 2012 Camry has brake vibration. Rear brakes pads have slight uneven wear. All four pistons boots have tears. Can my calipers be seizing? More than likely is the pads are seized or the pins are seized not very common for the calipers to seize themselves but more than likely you're going to take the rear brakes apart the pads will be seized and there's are not moving left and right and the pins will be seized because the boots are torn so if that's the case caliper is good it, it compresses very easy and you're good replace the clean that bracket very very well you're gonna actually need to grind it and something in the shop that you you're gonna eventually see me use i was still waiting for it to come in i use a sandblaster to clean those it comes out like new beautiful and it, you never have issues with them but uh to replace the pads if the pins are seized either clean them up really well or replace them and replace the boots very important that you do replace those boots and you should have no issues very rare for the calipers to lock up though Nathan Steenport, my 2017 OEM GX rotors keep warping about every 10 months. I live in a hilly area. What should I, should I buy drilled rotors? So I don't know if you've seen this video, the GX 470 that I recently had. So that GX actually, recent, after we filmed that video, it came, we, he came back for something else and the rear brakes were locked up. So we're going to fix those. One caliper was locked up. But the fronts were warped, and he's had this issue. He doesn't live in a hilly area, but he has a little bit of a heavy foot. Every 10 months to 12 months, it starts pulsating. He put drilled and, and slotted rotors. They lasted two years this time. So it's still going to happen. You're not going to you know, go the whole brake life without it happening because you live in a hilly area and not have a heavy foot. But it seems to make a difference. So try them that's really the only thing you can do and try them that's it's really going to be trial and error it's a heavy truck and the brakes are very small and that's just one of the limitations of them jeffrey allen congrats on the new shop thank you very much sir i have a 2005 ls430 that clunks behind the steering when going over bumps could this be an intermediate steering shaft not on these this is usually an intermediate steering shaft and the ones that has the issue it's when you turn at low speeds. But the clunks could be many things. I mean, could be strut, could be control arms, could be sway bar links, could be... It really, this is the kind of stuff that needs an in-person inspection. Pretty hard to tell. Nothing really super chronic with these to, to speak about. But I don't think it is an intermediate shaft because it's over bumps. But it, this just needs a general... Um, suspension inspection and that should be it folks we're going to take one last question we'll talk about the shop a little bit and then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your weekend i have a grand opening tomorrow it's going to be an interesting day i'm just going to take a random question i tried i wish we had the time where we sit here for six hours and answer every single question but that's well i already opened another question i'm going to answer it answer a question that mrs car karen i picked don't call it a day how about that rocco l it's a two is a 2018 NX300H with 51,000 miles a good deal? I found a 300H luxury for 34,000 that I am considering trading in my 180,000 miles of a Tacoma V6 for because $6 gas is frustrating. I hear you. Honestly, 
I don't like to comment on car prices because I hate, I really dislike the market that we are in right now. And this will vary greatly. A, the same car in Illinois will cost different than in other states. That's just supply and demand and prices will vary. But do your research on the price. I unfortunately can't advise on that. But a 2018 NX300H, 51,000 miles is a good car. And I think you're buying it for good reasons. You're trading in your Tacoma, which is a tank, which would easily last another 180,000 miles if it doesn't have rust. But you're trading in it for a very valid reason. Gas prices are really starting to hurt here. And I'm planning this week to film, hopefully, a video how to help you get better gas mileage from your hybrids. You know, everybody's switching your hybrids, but how do you even get more gas mileage out of hybrids? I'm filming that video here very soon. And... You'll see it, but I don't comment on prices because it really varies. How about the last question, Mrs. Carcara? What is it? Sean Zanico. Let me let me see it. Bring Will it down you your apply under forty I do not. So Sean is asking if we apply under coating since we're going to start the shop conversation. Let's do that. Would I apply under coating if you bring me the under coating? We do not, folks. The reason for that is uh, the EPA. You know, we got to protect the environment here. Opening a shop or doing something, oh, there's a major difference between you opening an automotive shop that is licensed, that is registered with the state. You have an EPA ID. You have all these environmental requirements. That is one thing. And another thing is me and my home garage <clears throat> close the door and start spraying away. You know, that's a different story. I, I will have random audits and visits from the EPA, and it's granted. We everybody has to put their part for the environment. You know that's just the way it is. As annoying as you might see it, and as costly as it is, and we're going to talk about this in a future video. But it is what it, that's the rules. And we got to play by the rules and follow them because they are not pointless rules. That's just everybody does their part. But unfortunately, I do not <clears throat> do undercoating at the moment because when I looked into it, I needed so much equipment basically almost turning this place into a paint shop to really be able to do it legally and correctly. It's at this point doesn't make financial sense. I invested a lot in this shop. I don't want to go through that route, but we'll get there one day. Maybe we'll see how it goes, but let's talk about the shop a little bit. Tomorrow is grand opening. Believe it or not, we're sitting in the shop. Everything's set. I am having a very hard time finding certain things. One of them is R134 refrigerant. Apparently, so every back order everywhere. If you guys have any leads, let me know. Um, and, and the and the other thing is gear oil. Be ready for gear oil prices to spike sharp, sharp, folks. If you have not done anything with, with gear oil recently, be ready and kind of sit down before they tell you the prices. The prices are spiking on everything fluid related engine oil to say spike but not as much as gear oil and believe it or not gear oil the rep from gear oil he told me the the like the 16 gallon keg the keg itself the metal costs a lot more than if you get plastic ones it's getting to that point which is pretty interesting but uh that's and somebody Jose Reyes says Walmart has a refrigerant. I wonder if they have 30 pounds because I can't buy you know small cans. I need 30 pounds. I have I have the license to do that. I have a 609, but I wonder. I'm gonna actually look into Walmart. I'll check them out. Maybe they do sell to to 609 holders. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, it's getting a little interesting. And if you you remember, you know, I, I was telling a story to a friend. Recent, you remember when you used to go to Walmart and you get oh five quarts of Movo One for nineteen nine five, and it's like, whoa, look at this deal! Or sometimes even fourteen ninety nine. Yeah, that's these are stories of the past that we will pass on to our, hopefully, just our children, not our grandchildren, because that is not the case these days, folks. It's it's incredible when I start buying some of this stuff. It's like, oh my god, these prices are unreal. This is. This is more than, than anything before, but it's, it's just going that way. What are you going to do? Guys, thank you so much for joining the live stream. Thank you for all your love and support. Um, I'm actually looking here. Auto Part International. I had 35 and an extra is actually a pretty good price. 
that was quoted double that for back ordered stuff anyways guys thank you so much for joining the live stream tomorrow's grand opening we're filming a bunch of videos tomorrow actually and you will start seeing actually i have a video coming up on a highlander that got we dis I discovered live how you find accident and you start investigating finding a major accident in this car and some bad tires so you'll see those and more coming up we're going to start filming a lot of videos here some of you commented on the um lighting in the shop we're working on that folks because i don't want to just make put lighting randomly and just see what i want to start filming and get your feedback see how it looks and then adjust accordingly but folks Let's not ramble more. Let you go enjoy your weekend. I enjoy my weekend. Get a good night's sleep because tomorrow is a big day for us. Thank you so much for watching the live stream. Thank you so much for watching the channel. Thank you for so much for all your encouragement, guys. You guys are the best. Somebody actually sent flowers. Some of you left voicemails here. Um, not wanting anything, donuts. just wanting to say hi. Somebody actually came here and dropped donuts. You guys are the best. Seriously, we are, we've been so swamped and tired and really putting everything together. But these kind of things, just the goodness of people and how good you guys are, really it kind of brings it brings us back to just realizing how, how fortunate and how blessed we are. And we are blessed to have known some of you. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining the live stream. Mrs. Car care not wants one more thing. Hold on. Someone asked. Yes. Come Toma? here. Come here. Mrs. Car care has a, has an interesting question. Let's see. What do we got? It was from Napa, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Dolma. Okay. Or biryani. Oh. <laughs> so dolma and biryani are two Iraqi foods. I'm from Iraq. If you don't know that, that's very tough. And if there's anybody that knows what these two foods are. Mm, I hope that, that the person who asked that question is planning to bring us either donuts, uh, I mean, biryani or, or doma. That would be nice. That would be amazing. They, they are a lot of work to do. So, <laughs> by the way, Mrs. Car Care Nut, guys. Hello. If you, her, if you haven't met her before, this is Mrs. Car Care Nut. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for all your love and support. Thank you for joining the live stream. I hope to see some of you here. We'll, we'll say hi to you, we'll meet you in person. and. Wish us luck. It's going to be an interesting, interesting week. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Guys, thank you so much for joining the live stream. Until the next live stream, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you guys have yourself a wonderful evening.